Long story short, I was diagnosed April 2012 with primary pulmonary hypertension. So in short, the blood can't circulate properly through my lungs and therefore I can't absorb the oxygen that I need. And it's degenerative. It's terminal. You're all here dressed today as what you'd like to be in 10 years time. Kind of glad I didn't have to do that because all that I want to be in 10 years time is alive and I'm not entirely sure that's gonna happen. People really hate it when I talk like that. Everyone here probably wants me to describe my illness as life-threatening or as serious. But it's not just life-threatening, it's terminal. I've looked up the statistics and asked all the difficult questions and I am dying. One of the most profound intellectuals of all time was Leonardo da Vinci. His passing in 1519 was regarded as one of the world's most tragic losses, and that's 500 years ago. And he once said that tears comes from the heart and not the brain. But the breath you take, where does that lead you to? For Jenna Lowe, each breath she takes is crucial. And with tears from her heart, I'm going to introduce you to this brave young lady, Jenna Lowe. The moment I think I knew intrinsically that something was wrong with me was when I went on a hike with my grade through the mountains around McGregor. And I found out later that I could have died on that hike. I was pushing myself. I thought I had asthma. I didn't realize I was in danger. And my heart was pounding. And I just remember standing on the top of a mountain and not being able to breathe and my friend coming and standing behind me and just counting slowly in and out so that I could finally find a way to get air in. We went to a physician and he did numerous tests from ECG, echocardiogram, blood tests, lung x-rays, you name it, um, and could find nothing. I must be honest that never at any stage did we think this is something terrible because she had been so healthy. I think we thought it was asthma that we would just, it would get, it would get sorted out. And so off to the asthma clinic and then they said, if it is asthma, then it's, it's actually quite a difficult to diagnose asthma because with asthma, you, you really battle to breathe in, right? <laughs> with Jen, she could breathe in, no problem. In fact, she panted a lot but she couldn't absorb the oxygen. She used to describe it as, you know, that feeling when you're underwater? Okay. And you're holding your breath, okay. and then you just want to come up for air, that feeling where you just want to come up and go. <gasps> okay. Like and she that. could never get that breath. Oh, my word. She could never get that relief. At different times of the day, she was absorbing different levels of oxygen. So then it became clear, well, this must be asthma. Went on to the medication. This is now all in grade 10, and she had been chosen to go to Australia on exchange for three months. For three and months, I went yes. over to visit her halfway through. And I was pretty shocked when I saw her that her condition was worse. 
her breathlessness was worse. And so we upped the medication. When she came home from exchange in December that year, I think that was the first time I realized this, this cannot be asthma. Or if it is, she's on the wrong medication, but she was not improving. And in actual fact, by then, in the December holidays, just walking from the car park to the beach was an impossibility for her. There was one test we hadn't done, which was a nuclear perfusion test. And he sent us for that. And that's when we realized she had hundreds of blood clots in her lungs. Um, there was still a possibility that it was blood clots in the lungs and that they would, with the use of blood thinners, they would dissipate and that we wouldn't know what had caused them. But there was also a concern that it could be pulmonary hypertension. But the gold standard test is a catheterized angiogram. When they didn't want to do that unnecessarily because it's quite invasive. It's an invasive procedure. And so only when she started to get worse, not better, after the blood thinners did they say, okay, we're gonna do the test. And that in itself was a story because it was a hell of a day and after the catheterized angiogram, she had a, um, she had a bleed. So that was quite hectic. And even then it took a good couple of months for a firm diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. What time of the year was it? Was it winter? Was it summer? Was it? It was May. Was it May? May, was it now? Cape Town, this time. May. May. Yeah. May. And so it, so was, it was the start of winter. This kind of autumn. Autumn. Please. She had a rare condition called pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is a, it's a rare disease, but it affects young women mainly, and it's a really tragic disease because it affects people in the prime of their life, and it is a very, very serious illness that um, is difficult to treat, is very expensive to treat, and um, I think hers was missed for a period of time because it's a difficult diagnosis to make. It's normally diagnosed as asthma or something else. Um, because when, I think when a young person like Jenna goes to see a doctor, people just can't believe that a young woman like that who looks so healthy and vibrant could have a serious underlying illness. So it's missed for a period of time and by the time it's diagnosed it's often quite late. And I think that was partly what happened to Jenna. I kept thinking she would be different or this couldn't be, or... Yeah, so when that final diagnosis came through, um, it still took a while, and I think for Stuart it was different. He, he knew. A few days later, when I really started doing the reading, I said to Stuart, well, it looks like from the reading that we're talking about three to five years, maximum. Standing alone in a crowd, puppet smile on, voice too loud. I tried to shove the hurt aside, to be here and now and go with life's tide. I know that these people can help, that they care, but I can't seem to face it, refuse to, can't bear to burden them with my sorrow, just as long as I'm not alone tomorrow. Present in each second, I savor every breath, all of life's sweet treasures, the beauty and the depth. It's hard to picture someday that I might fade away, but if I focus on right now, I think I'll be okay. Initially, the battle was to get the right medication in, because there was hope that if she got onto the right medication, that we would buy time. There was two and a half years between us, um, but it didn't really feel like it. Um, we were inseparable growing up. When she kind of went into high school, she just blossomed and turned into this 
confident, intellectual, beautiful woman. She went into hospital for the first time on my first day of grade eight. <laughs> Me and her had to grow up really quickly um, and face a lot of things that most people our age don't have to think about. There's a lot of denial that went on in the first couple months. I, I, at 14, you can't really understand the concept of um, a ter terminal illness. Like, you're not, it's also just goes against how life is meant to be, you know, like you're meant to grow up with your sister and grow old together and live your life together. When she was halfway through her grade 11 year, she went on to a mobility scooter because she could no longer walk. I called it Chase and it has a little number plate that says Chase on it. And I've named my one oxygen machine Thunder because it is incredibly loud and annoying and my little oxygen machine, Oxygen. At the end of her grade 11 year, she was voted um, deputy head girl, even though she was ill and on her mobility scooter. She, we then realized that we needed to get um, more treatment because the, the, the meds were not making any difference. And I think that the problem was that because she was diagnosed so late, she was already category three, palmary hypertension category three. There are only four categories. Her grade 12 year, she got sicker and sicker. She was not at school very much. Um, she still wrote her matric and she got eight distinctions. 98% was her highest mark. She was awarded one of the top 30 students in the country. But by then, she was really sick and there were two options. There was a drug called Flolan, which is an IV epiprostinol, which was not available on the African continent, never mind in South Africa. But this was the only drug that was maybe going to extend her life, so to bridge her to transplant. If I could get her onto that drug, the Flolan, then I hoped that I could buy her five to 10 years of life before needing a transplant. Um, we realised that a bilateral lung transplant was our only option. Um, bilateral basically just means both sides um, and two. So I would have to have both lungs transplanted. It's not an option for me to have only one. With a double lung transplant, the average life expectancy is five years. Then there are seven, eight, ten, sometimes fifteen years. But they're the exception to the rule. So as a mother, that didn't feel like enough time for me, no. right? Right. So I wanted to extend her life before needing transplant. Mm. And there was a very good reason to believe that the Flolan would do that, because it does. For a lot of patients overseas, they've had some patients who've been on Flolan for 15 years before needing a transplant. So we embarked on that, which was a hell of a thing because um, we needed Medical Control Council approval, Section 18A, so it's outside of the norm. So she was on that for a year. From straight up to matric. She went to matric rage, believe it or not, with her oxygen and her mobility scooter. I went too, so she was safe. Did Jenna go with her boyfriend? Yeah. And stayed in a house with five other friends. And then came back and then she had the surgery to have the port put in and then we started um, titrating the meds. I turned what's currently my office into what Jen called a drug den. Imported the medication from the UK, managed to get the drug on a compassionate basis from GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. David Badesh came over from UC Denver, Colorado with his nurse practitioner. Discovery helped me to fly him the in. Discovery helped you. If we were to share that expertise with the other doctors. Okay. So that's why we set up the symposia right. in Cape Town and Joburg. And then they helped me to learn how to mix the medication. She had a port that went into her chest, and then the drug was given through a pump right. that she wore 24 hours a day. So this little tube here, I'm just made of tubes, is actually attached to me. And that is a really complex procedure and we do it every day to ensure that um, the medication can't be stopped for a single minute. There's a lot of loss involved, there's a lot of sacrifice. 
from the lifestyle that I had to what I have now physically. But for me, the biggest challenge has actually been emotional and it's been in not knowing how far my condition will degenerate or any kind of idea of my future or what it holds for me. She had two boyfriends yeah. in the time that she was ill. The first boyfriend, Daffy, was um, Daniel, it's actually his name, but we called yeah, him yeah. Daffy, was someone who she had known since grade seven. And in fact, they started dating in grade seven. Yeah. It's a delightful story because they went out for three months. And then Daffy tried to kiss her on the cheek and she broke up with him <laughs> because it was all just moving way too fast. Um, so, yeah, but they remain very, very good friends. Um, and I know, um, I know Daffy was still very much into her at the time, so it was like quite a hard breakup for, as far as grade seven breakups can go. Five years later, she's in matric and um, she's not well and she's on oxygen and, and he just came back into her life. And they, Again, yeah. Life, yeah. And they dated Daniel. madly in love. They dated for a year. Yeah. And they were so amazing together and he was really incredible with her. At the end of the matric year, he had been accepted to go and stooge in New Zealand. And he said to Jen, I don't think I should go. And she was like, of course you're going. Of course you're going. You have to go, your life doesn't stop. Um, and he went. They were both still very much in love with each other, um, but they broke up because he was leaving and um, they didn't really know what the future held. Um, and I think, I think as hard as it was for him to leave, I think it was something that he kind of had to do. And he said to his best friend, James, look after Jen was maybe a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Jen and James um, were friends. He visited every single day. And eventually, uh, sort of nine months into the year, they fell in love. The meds weren't really making a difference and she was slowly, progressively getting worse. And then Professor Wilcox said, look, you need to go to Joburg, you need to see Paul Williams, you need to be listed. Why did they recommend um, Johannesburg? There were no lung transplants in Cape Town. Oh. And in South Africa, we've arrived a bit late on the scene, getting patients to have proper treatment because the treatment is extremely expensive and it is difficult to give in many cases, difficult to administer, as I'm sure Jenna very well illustrates. She, she in fact, received uh, the best treatment that was available uh, via an intravenous drip that she had. That was given to her late in her illness because of the great difficulty that uh, her parents had in accessing her treatment. And in fact, they enlisted the help of um, some very eminent people overseas who have continue to help us and are, are involved with our program still and have helped us to improve what we're doing in the field of pulmonary hypertension a lot. And it's because of patients like Jenna that we've been able to improve our treatment of things like pulmonary hypertension as well. But um, transplantation is always the very, very last step that one takes. So now she's on the flow line. We get halfway through the year. She starts at university. She now has a pump, full-time oxygen, and she's on a mobility scooter. And she insists on me driving up there, unpacking the mobility scooter, getting her on it with the oxygen, mm. with a pump, and off she goes to lectures. It's yeah. outrageous. It's outrageous. we realized she was getting worse. And we took her back up to Joburg and it just so happened that David Badesh, the doctor that we brought out from the States, was out again. He came out to help all the doctors here write the white paper for pulmonary hypertension. 
And so Paul Williams, him and a very well-known doctor, also from Europe, Pro Professor Nazrina Ghali, they saw Jen and that's when they said, no, it's time, she needs to be emergency listed for transplant. That was when, that was the first time I accepted that she would have to have the lung, the lung transplant. I had been fighting it till then because for me it just felt so brutal. The thought of taking your child's lungs out of their body, it's hectic. Mm -hmm. It's breath. It's the most primal connection to life. It's breath, it's your lungs. So for me, I think that it's of breath. all the transplants, it's brutal. And I do know that of all the transplants, it's the most difficult. It was her one chance at life. It sinks in that we need lungs and it sinks in that the chances of her getting them are very, very, very slim. Okay, that starts to sink in. At which time Stuart and I both go, well now what? Just wait for the possibility of getting lungs and the chances are so slim? No. It's weird for me to think about what I can do once I've got my transplant because for so long after I was diagnosed I had to let go of dreams that I'd held on to my entire life because I had the hard realization that, that my disease was really serious. Um, and then when I was told I was assisted for transplant it was like getting a second chance um, and I started to be able to dream again and hope and so for me, I think after I get my transplant, I want to go to UCT. I was there for one semester before I was too ill to attend. I want to study philosophy and psychology. I want to keep talking about organ donation. Uh, and I want to just be a normal human being and go to the beach and go dancing and do ridiculous things. Not reckless things though, because I think the one thing that I will never have that many teenagers my age have is um, a carelessness with my own mortality.